Welcome to worship. Hey. With the Universalist Unitarian Church in Peoria, my name is Reverend Jennifer Innes, and it is my great joy to serve as the minister of this congregation along with members and friends, children and youth of all ages and at all stages of life as we live out the mission of embracing freedom, loving inclusively, growing in mind, body, and spirit, and doing our part to add to the wholeness and the healing of the world. As part of that mission, we recognize our obligation to those who have come before. This is the ancestral home of the Peoria people. They welcomed the first Europeans who came exploring this land. The Peoria people made their home here long before those arrived. We also, in this congregation, demonstrate our care and mutual support by so many gifts that we offer, uh, gifts of time, gifts of talent, and certainly financial donations as well. Our financial support comes mainly from the members and friends of this congregation. So I want to invite you, we are not yet passing the plate, but as you leave the service today, you're welcome to offer a donation in the plates at the back of the service, at the back of the sanctuary. And of course, you're always welcome to join us in making a donation online as well. And now I want to turn to, uh, we had an, uh, an informal welcome of Carol Manny as the new membership coordinator last Sunday, and I want to do something a little bit more formal this morning. So I want to invite Carol to come forward. Okay. And I'm going to invite those of us who are gathered and those of us who are uh, joining us by computer or device uh, online, all are welcome to rise in body or spirit and help me with this, with this welcome, if you would, please. All right. Now, Carol came to us. Uh, she moved to Peoria just, just over a year ago, right? Uh, and so she is new to the area, came here to be closer to her daughter. Uh, she found us last winter and thinks that we are just the bee's knees. Absolutely. How about that? How about that? <laughs> and she comes into being a membership coordinator uh, with her experience of being a membership coordinator with the Lutheran congregation in western, west of Chicago, and also from her experience of over two decades as a teacher and creating community within those classrooms as well as offering the instruction. So I want to thank her for saying yes to us. So please. <laughs> Hello. So, so I need your help with this. So I want to offer. Look at this. Well, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna move. We're gonna have a little. More. So if you would offer, you know, if you so perhaps a hand raised and a hand off, a hand raised and a palm out and a hand lowered and a palm out. And join me in body or spirit. Carol, we welcome you. Your gifts, your energy, and all the community that we are now, we welcome you. We welcome the possibility of what we will become, and we will be a partner in welcoming all who connect with this beloved congregation. We bless you. We bless you and offer our care. We offer our wishes for you at the beginning of this journey with us, that you will get to know us and we will get to know you, and that our shared ministry will be long and abundant. Welcome to this house. Thank you. <laughs> so now you get to speak. Oh, oh good morning. I'm Carol Manny, I'm the new membership coordinator. And um, I want to start out by saying two things. I know I, I need to give announcements, but one is that I've been here a week. And I came to this church and came to this position in large part because of Reverend Jennifer and her positive way of seeing things and what she wants for this congregation. And over this week, just a week, <laughs> I have had that confirmed to me in so many ways. I am so happy to be here. 
I also want to say that I know that a lot of you are going to possibly maybe miss Nancy Rakoff a little bit. <laughs> and I want to let you know that I'm going to miss Nancy Rakoff too. And that that's the way it is. That just says how wonderful of a job she did and what an important person she was and is to this congregation. And we're different people. You'll come to know me in a very different way. And it doesn't take away any of our love for wonderful Nancy. Um, so while I'm talking about Nancy, next weekend, next Sunday after service, we are going to honor Nancy Rakoff and Nancy Taylor for the time and effort they put in on their jobs here. So that'll be after church. Um, please come and tell them exactly what they've meant to you and um, wish them well. Also today, the book sale, if you've got a bag, or even if you didn't, I think they have them, you can fill a bag full of books, and I think there's a lot of really good stuff still, um, for $5. So take advantage of that, because go in there and see what's there. There's a lot of really cool things. So thank you for being so welcoming, and I look forward to my time here. Thank you. And now let us enter into worship with our opening hymn from Jason Shelton, Morning Has Come. You're welcome to rise and body your spirit and enjoy the good music. From Ian Riddell, come, come, whoever you are, do you hear that voice calling you, calling us, that voice which calls us here together today in this space made holy by the presence and by our sacred breath we share with our singing and speaking and silence? Oh, and the humming too, I heard that humming. That voice which calls us to remember we are not alone and that we are inextricably linked to all of life, woven into a vast tapestry of existence of which we are a powerful, integral, and holy part. And just as we have been called together to hear today, we act as that voice, the heart, the hands of another call, the call to be with the wanderers, to sing and dance with the worshipers, 
to proclaim the memory of those who have taken their leave, wrap the despairing and the broken arms into, into arms of love and community, and hold the hands of all of us who have broken our vows and call us back again and again to the covenant and work of justice, humility, and steadfast faithfulness. For this, we are here together in worship today. And so, my friends, come yet again, come and let us worship together. I want to invite the Valentin family up to help light the chalice this morning. Our chalice lighting comes from uh, the Unitarian Versalist Association Leadership Council. They were speaking to the vision back in 2008 of a Unitarian Universalism in a multicultural world. And they said, with humility and courage born of our history, we are called as Unitarian Universalists to build the beloved community where all souls are welcome as blessings and the human family lives whole and reconciled. With this vision in our hearts and minds, we light our chalice. And now let us enter into music again with a welcome from our choir in Come, Come, Whoever You Are. Come, come, whoever you are, wanderer, worshiper, lover of leaving, ours is no caravan of despair. Come, get again, come. Come, come, whoever you are, come, come, whoever you are, wanderer, worshiper, lover of leaving, like to start with a question. Kids, do you ever hear grown-ups complain that there is just too much? And grown-ups, do you ever complain that there's just too much? Too much this, too much that, too many emails in your inbox, too many channels on the TV, too many brands of toothpaste to choose from, too many errands to run, too many tasks to do, too many distractions taking our attention away from what's important. Sometimes it can be a good thing, a great thing, to have an abundance of things. Abundance means having a lot, and usually in a good way, like lots of ice cream choices or lots of ways to be able to help a friend who's sad. But sometimes too much is too much. Too much can be so much that it buries what's important in our lives, like ice cream. Well, I don't know about that. But definitely the too much can make us forget to spend quality time with the people we love. The too much can keep us from knowing our own special gifts and giving them in ways that help make the world a better place. The too much can keep our minds and hearts so busy that we never slow down to pay attention. So we come together once a week, to raise up those things that are worthy of our heart's attention, our mind's attention, our spirit's attention. We come together to worship together. That's what worship means, to raise up that which is worthy. 
I like to think of worship as setting aside about an hour, sometimes a little more, and making the too much stay outside the door of the building or stay outside of the Zoom time and space so that we have time and space for that which is worthy of our attention, for that which is worthy of our heart's time and mind's space and spirit's attention. I think we all need to worship. Other traditions do it on Sundays. Some do it on Friday nights and Saturday mornings. Some do it on Friday afternoon. No matter the time, it's good for us. Raising up that which is worthy. Worship. I'm glad we do it together. It makes it so much better. So be it always. And now we offer our uh, recessional for our children to go to class. I know today is a special day for the grade four through six because they are beginning their Our Whole Lives program in particular. And the other classes have their programs as well. So let us. Let us enjoy the music of Go Now in Peace. We begin our time of sharing and reflection with a blessing from my colleague, the Reverend Abhi Janabanchi. Yesterday was the last day for celebrating the Festival of Lights known as Diwali, one of the most popular festivals in Hinduism. It symbolizes the spiritual victory of light over darkness, good over evil, and knowledge over ignorance. And the blessing reads, Wishing everyone who celebrate a joyous, healthy, and safe Deepavali. May the light of love and devotion shine brightly in your hearts. May the light of understanding shine in your hands. May the light of freedom glow in your home. May the light of service shine forth ceaselessly from your hands. May you radiate revolutionary love in the world. And with this blessing of light, we enter into our time of sharing the joys and sorrows among us and in the world. 
want to offer our joy for, of the congregation for today uh, for the success of the book sale. Thank you, Nancy Taylor and the entire team uh, for making this happen. And thank you to everybody who contributed, contributed all the donations of books so that they may have, may have had an abundant selection. And go forth and bring some of that abundance into your home before the end of the day today. Yes, I think Nancy would love that too. So now let me turn to a sorrow in the world. I want to offer our prayers and condolences to those who were in the crush of the concert in Houston on Friday night. I think there's still at eight people who died in the course of that evening and scores more were injured. Let us offer our prayers for those who have lost those they loved. We offer our support and encouragement for those who are taking care and treating of the, those who are recovering and for those leaders who then have the job of figuring out how to do better and prevent more injury in the future. This week also marks the, um, the celebration, the honoring of Veterans Day on Thursday, November 11th. I want to offer a prayer uh, in honor of that from Ren Bellavance Grace. And that prayer begins. If the only prayer you ever say in your entire life is thank you, it will be enough, as Meister Eckhart tells us. Today, we set aside time to publicly say thank you to our siblings who have served in the Air Force, Army, Coast Guard, Navy, and Marines. To say thank you to all who served, whatever their role, wherever their service took them. We say thank you to those whose service was brief and to those who made a career of this service. We say thank you to those who remember their service with fondness and we thank those whose time in the service still haunts them. We say thank you to those who returned to us largely intact, who found jobs, started families, and who continue to find ways to serve their communities. We say thank you to veterans who returned with brokenness so deep that they continue to struggle to find a role or even a home. God of many names, the source of all love, in the face of all this, sometimes, sometimes the only prayer we can offer is thank you. And we pray that it is enough. Please join me in a moment of quiet for all the prayers, the milestones, the names, the sorrows, and the joys that are with us, that are among us, and remain unspoken. I will light the candles and we'll hold the silence together.
Amen. Our reading today is from Reverend Ken Patton, who is one of our humanist Unitarian elders of the 20th century. This is, I'll offer, one of my favorite uh, readings about worship. Let us worship with our eyes and ears and fingertips let us love the world through heart and mind and body. We feed our eyes upon the mystery and revelation in the faces of our siblings. We seek to know the wistfulness of the very young and the very old. The wistfulness of people in all times of life. We seek to understand the shyness behind arrogance the fear behind pride, the tenderness behind clumsy strength, and the anguish behind cruelty. All life flows into a great common life if we will only reveal ourselves to our companions. Let us worship not in bowing down, not in diminishing ourselves or our neighbors. Let us worship in the opening of all the windows of our beings, with the full outstretching of our spirits. For life comes with singing and laughter, with tears and confiding, with a rising wave too great to be held in the mind and heart and body to those who have fallen in love with life. Let us worship and let us learn to love. We now turn to our next hymn by Joyce Poli, When Our Heart Is In a Holy Place. And you are welcome to rise in body or spirit to enjoy this hymn together. Where you go, I will go, beloved, 
Where you go, I will go. Where you go, I will go, beloved. Where you go, I will go. And your people are my people. Your people are my. Your people are my people. Your divine, my divine. Where you go, I will go, beloved. Where you go, I will go. Where you go, I will go, beloved. Where you go, I will go. And your people are my people. Your people are mine. Your people are my people. Your divine, my divine. I love a good invitation. That is one of those, for me, that brings me into worship. I think that is one of the essential opening elements of when we gather on Sunday morning or at any time. We have named the time to be precious and holy and special. It is. It always begins with an invitation to be present, to be with the people. But I also wonder... I wonder sometimes if we thought about what are we inviting ourselves into? What are we inviting others in with us to do? So this morning, I want to offer a reflection on why we gather in worship. This Sunday meeting in particular, of course, regularly created and shared, but in all the ways that we gather, all the ways that we have time set aside, A worship service is the central action and gathering of a religious community. It is that of this congregation. We meet every Sunday at 10.30 a.m. Central. Boy, in this pandemic have I been working with the time zones uh, and learning about where our time is. And also we have the extra special moment of fall back. So thank you for joining us this Sunday as well. I hope you had a little extra sleep. In this day and age, because in this day and age, we are really finding out how we all gather in all the times and spaces, because some of us catch the recorded service at another time. But the Sunday morning service is, in its way, a fixed point in space and time around everything, around which everything else revolves. So today, let's examine the nature of worship and the religious service in our current context. Now, I'll offer part of why bringing this up now is that this year, um, my second year in ministry with you, our second year together in ministry, is kind of year one, part two. Ah, see, I'm not wrong. (laughs) In returning to be with each other in person, in so many aspects of congregational life, particularly worship, we are picking up the threads of ministry that were interrupted or at least not fully addressed in the way they would have been if we could have been around each other when I first started here a year ago in August. And the first years of a new ministry in particular includes people getting to know each other's values and habits and histories and language. And part of what I did in this first year, intentionally in worship, and and now as we're going into our second, is to develop a shared vocabulary, as well as listening to yours. And now, we'll begin with a first conversation on worship. As one of my colleagues said that, Sunday morning worship is an ongoing, Sunday morning preaching is an ongoing conversation. So this is just one of many to come. Now, so today we'll have a little bit of language, a little history uh, of what worship means, a little vocabulary lesson too. We'll talk about how, a little bit about what worship means in our particular context right now in the state of the world and then how we might go forward together. I have an invitation for you at the end of the sermon. Ultimately, what we consider in this moment 
in worship in particular, but certainly in congregational life in general, is how then shall we live? Given all of our frailties, all of our wonders, the fact that we are, as human creatures, spectacularly mortal and finite, and yet we are the inheritors and living beings of star stuff. How then shall we live? I want to offer beginnings of a definition from my colleague, the Reverend Richard Gilbert. Uh, he's the author of uh, one of the older curriculums, some of you may know, Building Your Own Theology. Uh, but he talks about a Unitarian Universalist interpretation of worship in his book, The Prophetic Imperative, The Social Gospel in Theory and Practice. And he says, the church is a worshiping community a religious community that deliberately and regularly gathers together to celebrate life in all its dimensions. Worship is understood as the celebration of life, as is the most generally accepted definition in Unitarian Universalist circles today. Worship derives from the Anglo-Saxon worth sheep, pointing to and celebrating that which is of worth. It's kind of that simple, actually. Religion, as a word, is derived from the Latin religare. It means to bind together. And the form of this religious worship is the, called a liturgy, from the Greek word laos, or people, and ergos, work. Literally meaning the liturgy is the people's work. All of this, he says, leads us to an understanding of worship as a binding together or a coming together of people to fashion ceremonies pointing to what they regard is of worth. So let me unpack that. That was a lot of different languages all at once. Some of us are working on English still. Me too. So worship is a celebration that points out what is of worth. It, is, it points to our essential values, our ultimate priorities. And we'll do some more of that actually next week with looking at the formation of our sense of seven principles in Unitarian Universalism. Every moment in our principles when we turn to beginning to affirm the inherent worth of every person, when we encourage the search for truth and meaning, and when we wrap up those seven principles with realizing how radically connected we are with each other and all of existence, just by speaking those and remembering those, we are honoring what is of worth, what we value most. Worship in Unitarian Universalism includes elements of these values that are expressions of and aspirations of the multitude of theologies that are among us. So religion names how we are connected within a particular tradition or community. And liturgy, all the elements of the service, uh, are experienced by and created by the people. You have, in fact, your order of service, uh, if you took one today or if you have it electronically, that tells you the sequence of how we shall be engaged in worship. Now, this comes largely, our inheritance of this form uh, comes largely from our Protestant Reformation roots. So it was the study of scripture, it was the singing of hymns and other music, there was a sermon offering the interpretation of the word. We also had the liturgy that included the prayers and the opening and the closing and the responsiveness. Uh, in Protestant worship also would include the sacraments, you'd have confession, you'd have forgiveness, you'd have communion in that as well. Now, in Unitarian Universalism, we're a little bit less about the sacraments, I will say. But we certainly have, uh, but that's not true for all of us sometimes, and sometimes that is seasonal as well. But we certainly include the scripture, the scripture which may be ancient or modern, and the sermon which would be the interpretation of the scripture, the interpretation of the text, whether it be from the Bible, whether it be from poetry, whether it's the newspaper, or whether it's the world. But I want to pause here and 
uh, address the question that, as, as my spouse Patrick and I were talking about this last night, um, the question of a why, why do we call it a worship service? Why do we call it a worship service? What is that? And I'm going to say, Patrick and I both were like, huh, we hadn't quite had that question before. Service. So why is this a service? So the definition of service is a series of actions. It is to be engaged. It is to be doing something. We call it a worship service because that's the kind of series of actions that it is. We talk about a religious service because it's the kind of event and gathering that a religious body um, might hold together. So it's kind of that simple. So the order of service is also the order of, it's the liturgy, but it's also the order of actions. That's why it's called the order of service. I also want to recognize uh, for some folks in Unitarian Universalism and in our congregation, in fact, have some real challenges with some of this religious language, um, particularly with the word worship. For some people, worship implies um, kind of a, an unquestioning obedience to a larger guy deity out yonder something that we're obliged to um, and expected to be um, holding as more important or greater than us and more powerful and so on. Or there's any number of reasons why somebody might have a religious background that uh, would have them be, find worship to be difficult. And I want to recognize that and, and honor that. And I think that's partially why our obligation as in Unitarian Universalism, kind of our public service to the world, frankly, is to be able to kind of talk about religious language and what it means and not simply let it be held by those who have abused its meaning or who have harmed others with difficult or terrible theologies. Um, and I'm happy to be having more conversations about that. I pretty much expect that I might be having some more conversations about that after this service, too. And that's OK. So worship is a dedicated, intentional time out of time. The service of it is the act of holding that time together. It's a time that's different than any other time in our lives, in our week. It's the effort to celebrate what we hold closest to us and that it merits a special designated moment. The worth of our the recognizing and honoring what's important to us and our great questions merits a dedicated time. It's part of a spiritual practice. But also, what we offer as our values is so dear and so challenging that it needs a designated time. A religious service, a worship service, is kind of casting an existential bubble around this hour to have the time we need to enter into the great questions and our great concerns within the hold of the gathered people. I love this idea of this time set aside, this time made precious and out of time. And in this moment, we get into those great questions. How do we care for each other? How shall we go and be of service, you know, offer our work in the world? How shall we wrestle with the great questions of why do terrible things happen to lovely and wonderful people that we know and we may not know? How shall we take up the moral questions of our time and age about oppression, about the climate, about our politics. How then shall we live? That takes, it really takes time to do that well. And what we do in the course of that time is not simply to wrestle with those questions or feed our souls, but to also come out at the end a little different than when we started. That if we take this time seriously, 
that we would be, that we would be transformed. Maybe just a little bit, maybe great leaps, but a little bit every week or every time that we gather. Now, let me say a little something about worship in our time, in this context in particular. My colleague, the Reverend Elizabeth Stevens, whose doctoral work was on uh, trauma-informed worship, talked about this with Reverend Erica Hewitt as part of our UUA conversations. And uh, Reverend Elizabeth talks about how being part of worship in this time requires authenticity and vulnerability. Trauma is when something, something has happened to us, something difficult, violent, harmful, that disrupts how we understand the world, our existential presence in the world. And it is compounded, the experience of trauma can be compounded if we don't find a way to address what has been shaken at our core. It is the practice of being real is part of that. The Reverend Bill Sinkford said that the purpose of worship is to prove that we can tell the truth and survive. The purpose of worship is that we can tell the truth and survive. And what Reverend Elizabeth said is that it's the practice of telling the truth so we can survive together. Together. Our gathering, our gathering is about helping each other co-regulate. So here's a little emotional intelligence language. That our coming together makes an enormous difference in our ability to moderate and handle all that is within us, all that swirls around us, all the too muchness that Amy was talking about in the story. There's a way in which, she says, somewhere on the other side of trauma, there's wisdom, there's gifts, there's the breaking down of barriers, there's wholeness, there's a deeper humanity, but we can't get there by ourselves. It absolutely requires that a community is there around us, that we have those connections. It is like this great web of which we are a part, that existential web of existence. That web itself does the work. She goes on to remind us that we are a long way from a country that is faithful to our ideals. Let me repeat that again. We are a long way from a country that is faithful from, to our ideals. Can I get an amen? amen? Amen. So we're going to have more trauma as we are on that journey. It's going to get worse before it gets better. I don't think that's a surprise but it's going to get worse before it gets better. And there is no more important work than helping folks metabolize trauma and stay human. Come back again and again to the best parts of ourselves. She says, that's what worship is for. And that's what worship right now is the focus of, focus of religious community, focus of the congregation. That is what the church is for right now is helping people stay human in the face of inhumane circumstances. I'll say again, helping people stay human in the face of inhumane circumstances. It really touched me uh, as we were, people were starting to gather back in person over the summer and throughout since then, how much People missed each other while being so separated. You know, coffee hour was like the best thing on Sunday morning, no matter what I did for worship sometimes. Right? I'm okay. I get it. I get it. I know that. And you know that. Sometimes it is the thing you need. We get to help each other stay human. What a gift. 
What powerful ministry. So to my fellow co-regulators, because let me tell you, this pandemic's been hard on me too, right? Mm -hmm, Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, all of us. (laughs) Witness, we get a witness back there. So to my fellow co-regulators, because you are, I have an invitation. I really want us to be in this, in this moment, in this kind of year, year, year one, part two. We have an opportunity to be kind of thinking about and reshaping and crafting worship together. We have a chance to build something a little bit different, a little bit new, as well as love what has always been loved. So I offer an invitation. We started having a worship planning conversation back a few weeks ago. I want some more. We need more involvement and more people. And you know, there's a lot of different ways that we can help each other out. But I really want to make sure that this, you know, the liturgy, the worship is, the service is the work of the people. And, And I want to extend that invitation to make sure that you really know that is true. Because those, the ideas and the sparks and the music and the stories and uh, the questions and the angles, I don't presume to know. I can't know every possible potential and explore all the opportunities. We have to do this together. So I want to invite you to come and join me in being part of our conversation, our ongoing building conversation about worship, about the service that we create together and going forward. Oh, I hear there's Christmas Eve coming. Boy, let me drop a hint there. We're going to figure out something for Christmas Eve. So let us open our full entire souls to the moment we have together. Let us worship. As, as Ken Patton reminds us, let us be with those who have learned to fall in love with life, to support those whose faith in life is broken or wounded. Let us worship. And indeed, let us learn to live in love. Amen. Our, for our closing hymn, Uh, For the beauty of the earth, and you are welcome to rise in body or spirit and join me in enjoying the hymn.
We send forth this flame with words from the Reverend Barbara Peskin. Because of those who came before, we are. In spite of their failings, we believe. Because of and in spite of the horizons of their vision, we too dream. Let us go, remembering to praise, to live in the moment, to love mightily and bow to the mystery. We go forth in simplicity, finding and moving on the path that leads to compassion and wisdom, to happiness, peace, and ease. Let us welcome the stranger, open our heart to a world in need of healing, be courageous in the forces of hate, Hold and embody a vision of common good that serves the needs of all the people. Let us go forth. Our worship is ended. Let our service begin. <laughs>